Hello, hello, and thanks for joining me on another purview day. So, since the preview came out and is your purview, there's been loads of interest, loads of excitement, people trying to do interesting stuff. But the one big question hanging over it has always been price. People saying, oh, four, four capacity units turned on permanently, and we'll get onto what a capacity unit is. It's been a, bit, a little bit expensive. There's basically been a bit of sticker shock of people looking at it and going, I just want to try it out. I just want to get started and see if it's right for me. I want to use a little bit of it, and then if I like it, I'll use a lot more of it. But it didn't really have that ability to scale when it was first released. Now, a couple of weeks ago, back in August, there was a big announcement saying they've introduced Elastic Scale for Purview, which is fantastic. Essentially, rather than defaulting to four of these capacity units, it will default to one and then scale as you use it. Now, if you didn't create your Purview account after that point, so if you created your Purview account recently, you don't need to worry. If you created your Purview account earlier than 19th of August, I think it was, then you're going to need to either sit tight and wait, and then at some point over September, October, you'll be upgraded to the new version. Or if you are impatient like me, I deleted my Purview account, I recreated it, so I can demo it to you today, because it's not just pricing. So there's been some changes to pricing and scale, there's changes to some of the UI where things are kept, and there's some changes around how we can do some security stuff. There's also one or two things I've snuck in that we can go and get a deeper look at what Purview is actually doing behind the scenes. So we've done that. I've got my nice, fresh Purview account. I then realized that by deleting my Purview account, I've lost all my previous demos. Uh, but that'll be fine. Well, we can deal with that. So yeah, we're going to have a look at the new pricing concepts, make sure we understand how it's going to charge us, and then take a look at the new UI bits and pieces. If it's your first time here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Stay a while, listen. Uh, pop something in the comments to let me know, is this useful? Are you going to use Purview now that the pricing changed? Is that the deciding factor that's made you reevaluate it? Were you happy with the price because you've been paying insane amounts for other enterprise scale governance tools and it doesn't actually seem that bad? Really interested to see what people are actually thinking of this change. So let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, let's go take a look. Okay, so I've got my advancing Pur2 here. So this is my recreated Purview account. And the main fun thing that we can see here is platform size, one capacity unit. So previously, when we created Purview, we had to choose between four and 16 capacity units. Essentially, kind of like servers, how many machines you want grinding away in the background to get to where you need to be. And it's like, uh, four, I guess. How much is that going to charge me? I don't know. Um, so let's dig into that. Let's talk about capacity units and what they actually mean. So there's a load of info about it. So when they came out with the Elastic Data Scale, they built this whole thing that goes through and explains what a capacity unit is. So one capacity unit is 25 operations in a second or two gig of internal storage. Actually, the combination of those two. That's what you get with one CU, 25 operations a second and two gig of storage for all of your assets. So when we're talking about Purview, we talk about an asset. That's all bits of JSON, right? And it's the assets that you've stacked. It's the relationships between other assets. It's the metadata that hangs underneath those. It's things like the schema objects. Um, it's all the lineage objects. So if you think, you know, maybe I've scanned 100 tables. Well, that's 100 objects. And then each of the column values inside there, each of the lineage between that column and to that column in, as part of a data transfer, each of the governance objects that you associate to it, each of the classification objects that you associate to it, there's actually a lot of these different object types that are in our data map. But the two gig is still actually quite a lot. There's quite a lot of data in there that you can still stick and float behind, beneath that kind of two gig layer. So if you think about I'm making a load of changes at once, I'm running a massive update and updating every single file in my entire data estate, well then I'm gonna get more than 25 operations a second. And the nice thing is that they think about those two concepts separately. So how much storage have I got? And how much operations do I need? How much interaction? How many transactions am I making with it? So they've got some examples if we scroll down a little bit to talk about the different billing amounts, talk about how you're using things. But this is the interesting one, that kind of billing idea. So you've got the idea of your storage amount. Your storage amount is how much you have to fit. And at the moment you go over two gig, the moment I've got more than two gig of assets across all those different JSON files, it has to ramp up to two capacity units because it needs that storage. Whereas on the flip side, if I've only got one gig, say, of data assets stored, and have a massive spike in transactions, it'll scale up, but then it'll scale back down again. 
So you've got the kind of flex of the ceiling when it's doing lots of heavy workloads and heavy transactions. And then you've got this kind of ratchet effect that it'll slowly scale up if you put enough data into it, if you have enough assets scanned, if you could put lots and lots of stuff in there. So have a look through this doc, really useful to understand how to think about how many of these kind of um, different compute units uh, we're actually using or capacity units. Cool, so that's the idea of a capacity unit. We saw that mine's currently at one. Uh, I'm not gonna try and get it forced it to go up and put loads of data in, but just you can go and have a look at that and see what it currently scales at. The bigger question going, well, okay, I've got this arbitrary idea of a CU. What does that actually mean in terms of cost? So under the purview pricing, it's not in the pricing calculator yet, but if you go to the Azure purview pricing page, now that we understand what an elastic data map is, we can talk about the capacity units. We see we've got that price of, what it pounds, of 30 pence of 0.307 pounds per capacity unit per hour. In terms of what that actually means, we just go for a cheeky little manual Azure pricing calculator. Um, in terms of the Azure pricing calculator, if we say something's turned on 24 seven, if we say this is going to be turned on all day, every day for a given month, uh, the base unit of estimation they use is 730 hours. That is my, I'm just not gonna switch off. Let's turn on for a month. And yes, months have different days and the, there is flex as an estimate to say roughly how much in an average month is this gonna cost? 730 hours is our baseline. So if we're saying I've got one capacity unit and I'm not doing huge amounts and so I'm not gonna scale above that, that means our baseline cost is 224 pounds per month to turn on per view and have it with a small amount of data in there and not under massive, massive loads. That's far more reasonable. But when we first looked at the preview and the baseline was four, we're saying it's 900 pounds a month. And that kind of is just a bit, it's like, oh, that's a lot. If we've got like a little demo environment, I can build that for about the same, my whole environment. And then the thing to govern it costs the same, that doesn't seem right. So absolutely much, much cheaper now. They get away with having it as that 225-ish pounds per month. Um, and yeah, it's not as cheap as depending on a five pound a month basic as your SQL database. It is expensive because it's an enterprise governance tool. So it's gonna have a price associated to it. But now at least the price is a lot more representative of the kind of workloads people are doing. It allows you to do the small little things. Basically, it opens up for SMEs. You've got small, medium enterprises, so like smaller companies have data management and quality problems too. And that means they can use it at these lower levels and it just makes sense. So that's where we're at with pricing. Pricing is a lot more reasonable. Obviously, you can go and check out pricing in your local currency, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, interesting. It has gotten better. It's a lot more relatable. It's a lot more approachable. And you can turn it on for a bit and then you can't turn it off. You can't pause it. You have to delete it and then lose all your demo. Anyway, cool. So pricing, that's what we've got. So either if you had a preview beforehand, it'll switch over at some point in September, October, or you can go the brute force way of delete it, recreate it, and you'll see it in this one capacity units means I'm on the new format of it. The other new bits that you'll see when you switch over to this new version, there's a couple of bits out here, actually. You can see things like managed resources. So when we're using things like Databricks, the Databricks, when you spin up Databricks uh, workspace, it creates a separate managed resource group. And when you create clusters and things, you'll see it creating VMs and deleting VMs and creating VMs and deleting VMs. Uh, and actually we've got the same idea here for Purview now. So we, it automatically creates a storage account where it keeps your data. It automatically creates an event hub where it keeps your data. So actually, if you're trying to get an idea of what is this thing? Why, 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 where's it storing my data? You've actually got a storage account. You can go and see what's going on. Now, like other managed resource groups, this is all locked down. Probably shouldn't even look at this go and see all the files it's creating which is interesting the files themselves are locked down so you can't go in and see what's inside that file i mean technically you could brute force your way into it and get hold of those things but it's a managed resource group it's not supported to go and have a look inside there but it is interesting because you can means you can keep an eye on the size of those things you can have an understanding of how much throughput's going through both on your event hub and your storage account yeah interesting that you we've now got visibility of that stuff where we didn't have it previously Okay, so let's go and dive into the UI. So UI kind of looks the same, right? No real changes there. We still got the same landing page. You can see I've, kind of, I've given it a nice name, Advancing Catalog, rather than Advancing Per 2. We've got some ability to, to tailor it slightly for our users. And then we've got the normal bits that we've got here from the catalog. 
Now the main change is over here. So you can see we no longer have data sources. We've now got data map. So they've lent heavily into, you know what? Let's just show users it's called the data map. Let's not call it data sources and things there. And then as soon as we talk about the actual system, call it data map for the technical people. Just everyone knows it's the data map. That is the map of all of our uh, data in our estate. So when we're talking about adding data sources, we're registering scans, we're registering kind of a lake and all that kind of stuff. That still happens in this data map area. So this is, again, looks fairly similar. We've still got this, these idea of collections. And then inside collections, we've got various different data sources we've registered. Obviously, I lost all mine. Um, but the whole way that we think about these collections has changed. So the collection kind of used to just be an arbitrary box. We just, yeah, well, let's put those in that collection, those in that collection. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just kind of like drawing a little line around some data sources so I can group them nicely in a diagram. Now, for the updated refreshed version of Purview, we've actually got this whole collections management piece where we can see a hierarchy of our collections and see what's inside it. But most importantly, we can manage security here. So rather than having security in the management layer as it was previously, so I used to have to go out and into the management portal and then I can assign roles and say, you're allowed to read all the data, you're allowed to curate all the data. We now actually do that on a catalog basis, which is far more fine grained. So I can say, well, actually you're a data curator, but only of the data that you have access to. So we can actually sort of make this nice, um, federated, distributed uh, thing of people managing their own data. We're no longer saying you, if you create some data, you can do it for all the data that we possibly have in the organization, which just makes so much more sense. So under a given collection, we can have admins, data source admins, data curators, and data readers. So we can say, well, actually, you can read all the data assets we've got for that nice semantic layer. But you can't go and read all the data assets that we've got in the lake because you just wouldn't have a clue what you're looking at because there's folders and there's Spark things, there's loads of stuff there. And it means we can kind of tidy it up. We can have personas defined across our data estate and map them nicely on these collections. So we can do that on each of the collections. So we can have a real hierarchy of all these different collections of data sources, and then we can set uh, limits there. So super nice to see that. That's a really, really nice improvement that we've got this granularity of collections. You'll also notice that some of the other pieces that used to be in the management area are now over here as well. So we're talking about scan rule sets. We're talking about the integration runtimes to go and get data. We're talking about classifications, those kind of uh, automatic, you know, that's a bank account, that's a person's name, that's an email address, those kind of recognizing the type of data that we're seeing. Uh, these are all now living in our data map. They are part of that estate, which again, it's part of a security thing. You're allowed to go and manage the data set, but you're not allowed to manage the whole admin for purview. And they've separated those two out to those two different main areas. So management, a lot simpler than it used to be. There's a lot less stuff here because the actual, the core purview admin has been separated out. And that's mainly the main change. That's the, the big thing is they just changed how we think about collections, changed how we think about security, changed where we do that kind of stuff. The other interesting thing is we no longer have glossary knocking around in this side menu. So the glossary items, if you need to get to it, you need to get through the main catalog. The same with browsing assets, right? If you want to go and have a look at your assets, you have to go to this data catalog and then you can drill down into assets and drill down and go and find some stuff. Same with the glossary. You can go into the glossary terms, you can go and see the info, you can go and create your term templates, your terms, all that kind of stuff. So that all kind of works the way it used to work. It's just there's a slight change in the UI as to where you go to find things and how you go and set it up. Ooh. And I think that's mainly all the things I wanted to go through, really. So big, big, big thing to be aware of is you want to go and make sure that you are on this one capacity unit. You are on the new elastic scaling. Have an awareness of that elastic scale in terms of when are you using it? The workloads that you've already got in Purview. Actually, how many capacity units does that need to be? Because I've got, what, 5,000 or so assets that I've registered? Yeah, 5,800. And that still fits really easily inside a 2 gig storage limit because it's just bits of JSON. It's not a huge amount of data. So be interesting to see when people are starting to map out their bigger states. Where are you finding that lands in terms of those capacity units? Are you scanning everything and you've got millions of assets and you're like, oh no, I'm actually automatically already at four capacity units anyway. In which case, the pricing was about right for what you're trying to map. Or are you doing it like me and going, oh, okay, well, this is tiny. It doesn't even fill up one capacity unit. Cool. I'll benefit from that pricing. It'll be interesting to see where people land on that scale of scaling. Yeah. 
So, as I said, that is all I've got time for today to run through a little bit of purview changes and some interesting tidbits inside there. Do take a look. Do let me know how you get on with it. Let me know if you like the new security metrics, if you're going to be using it. Has this changed your mind about whether or not you're going to use purview? I would love to hear. So let me know down in the comments. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time. Yes.